okay, so um, thank you very much for your first talk. That was really interesting. It's, it's, mine's kind of more, I suppose, forward-looking, perhaps, but it was really interesting to see sort of the origins of some of those techniques, and some of them I'll, I'll talk about here. Um, as Lucy said, I'm Nicholas Crabb. I'm a final year PhD student at uh, University of Brighton. Um, I'm also a senior geophysicist at Wessex Archaeology. Um, my PhD project is funded by CEHA, which is an ESPRC centre for doctoral training. And I'm also um, working in partnership with Robin Jackson at Worcester County Council and Andy Howard at Landscape Research and Management. My project is more uh, specifically focused on the application of remote sensing techniques within alluvial environments, but today I wanted to talk more broadly about how we can integrate archaeological inspection methods within, um, well, or for the investigation of the distribution of archaeological sites within these complex depositional zones. Uh, let's use that. So before I do that, it's, it's useful to briefly kind of conceptualise some of the challenges that we face within alluvial environments. So river valley systems have obviously provided an extraordinarily resource-rich location for a whole range of past human activities throughout history. They're a source of water, a diverse range of food sources, and as well a, a means of travel and transport. In addition to this, the high water tables that we find in alluvial floodplains obviously create these anoxic conditions where cultural and environmental material can be extremely well preserved. But problematically, the thick alluvial sediments that are often present within these floodplains render most conventional forms of archaeological prospection, such as uh, gradiometer survey and uh, aerial photography, relatively ineffective to some extent. Despite this, there are an assemblage of alluvial landforms that we can use to provide a record of the evolution of these river systems, but also these alluvial landforms also have a variable um, archaeological and paleoenvironmental preservation potential. So, just to sort of conceptualize that further, this is sort of a typical cross-section through a floodplain environment. And as you can see, a lot of the higher, drier areas form the focus of archaeological activity. And often settlement activity occurs at the floodplain edge, as well as on topographic high points such as gravel islands and natural levees. Um, in lower elements of the floodplain, you may encounter or buried soils or former land surfaces may form. And these can be quite deeply buried by alluvial sedimentation. But often provide a record of this, the influence of past and present vegetation. Similarly, paleo channels obviously also act as a sink for environmental material, which we can use to make wider reconstructions of the landscape. Um, traditionally, the way that archaeologists, and more specifically geoarchaeologists, have approached trying to investigate these um, geomorphological landforms and alluvial landscapes is through intrusive methods. So this can be either through the recording of exposed quarry sections, or the excavation of long sections and step trenches, as well as boreholing and test pitting, obviously. But these can be quite labour intensive and sometimes quite costly and impractical, um, particularly if you're considering an area at a large scale. And some of these data points that we may collect can be quite sparsely distributed, so it can be. Yes, mapping borehole logs and geotechnical logs, but. Um, similarly, they can also be quite poorly placed and often lack the detail that we really need to reconstruct alluvial landforms in terms of um, archaeological potential. So more recently, geoarchaeologists have developed more computational and predictive models, um, predictive methods of trying to make, investigate these areas through deposit modelling, which is essentially a, a method of just defining the distribution of these or the, defining the archaeological potential based on uh, the sediment character and different types of alluvial landform. So it, it usually combines multiple intrusive records that we can use to record the subsurface sediment architecture and stratigraphy to identify these geomorphological processes and landforms. So you can see here from this example from Covent Garden in London that uh, at multiple boreholes we used to cr essentially create this elevation model. So we're sort of m mapping the subsurface topography essentially to highlight these lower lying wetter areas and higher drier areas where we may have variable archaeological potential, but the lower lying areas less likely to contain specific archaeological features, but higher dry areas such as gravel islands, potentially having more, uh, less, less pale environmental material, but more likely to have specific archaeological uh, deposits on them. Um, again, this is normally reliant on intrusive data, but we can integrate um, proxy information relating to the subsurface, either through remote sensing techniques or geophysical survey. And I wanted to spend the rest of uh, the presentation just kind of highlighting a range of the, the techniques that we can use and also how we might implement them within deposit modeling. So arguably one of the most accessible data sets that we have as archaeologists is LIDAR with um, 
open government license data, is, it's now kind of nationally available at a relatively high spatial resolution. Um, so it's a really incredible resource, and although it requires some technical expertise to process some of that data, there's an increasing sort of um, variety of visualization methods we can use, and also sort of open access options for processing that data. Um, it's obviously extremely effective at ex mapping topographic features. So for this example, from the Lower Lug Valley in Herefordshire, that's not, that's not whoop, <laughs> um, you can see that paleo channel has very clearly been delineated as a topographic feature, but also this uh, slight high point here, which is a, a, a likely a gravel island. And this was corroborated for a single borehole transect. But you can see how we can use the surface topography as a baseline for investigating the subsurface. However, problematically with LIDAR, anything that isn't expressed topographically, either it's been ploughed um, plowed level or perhaps um, infilled by thick layers of alluvial sediment that may mask it, essentially, we would just simply won't locate them through, through this technique. So we need to look at other methods, and perhaps one of the more underexploited resources that we can sometimes access is um, multispectral imagery. The key advantage of multispectral imagery is that it incorporates near-infrared wave bands where differences in the health of vegetation and soil moisture, which can obviously relate to subsurface archaeological features or alluvial landforms, um, can be better expressed, or often they're expressed more clearly than, than in the visible spectrum. Um, and as, this is again the lower leg, um, lower leg case study from my PhD research, and you can see how that paleo channel is again clearly delineated, but also this lower lying area adjacent to the flood, um, gravel island is also indicated as an area of lower vegetation health, essentially. Um, and with increasing sort of higher spatial resolution satellite systems and reductions in cost, as well as the advent of UAS mounted systems, most spectral data is increasingly accessible for us as archaeologists, but it still kind of remains relatively underused, perhaps. Um, we can also obviously use a whole range of geophysical methods, and having said that a lot of um, conventional forms of prospection, such as gradient sur survey, will be relatively ineffective, where the alluvium doesn't exceed one metre, such as this example in the Po Valley in northern Italy, it can be really effective. So you can see here the clear delineation of an Iron Age necropolis in amongst a dense network of uh, paleo channels. Similarly, seizing vapour instruments may also provide some increased sensitivity within this setting, but in really deeply buried areas, it's still unlikely to be that effective. We can also use GPR and earth resistance surveys, but again, they're hindered by the presence of clay and also high groundwater content. So we can, we'd sort of need to sort of think slightly outside the box when we're trying to locate um, archaeological resources within these environments. <coughs> um, as Andy alluded to, we're now carrying out gradiometer surveys at a sort of unprecedented level of scale, and we're sort of working at a landscape scale now. Sort of hundreds of hectares have been collected. And so, while some of them may be inappropriately deployed within these floodplain settings, we can start to delineate um, some very fully interpreted by archaeological geophysicists. So, we're not necessarily looking for specific archaeological features, but perhaps looking for slightly different variations in the background response of certain regions, which we can then relate to these alluvial landforms. So <coughs> this is an example from the London Gateway development, and you can see how we're, there are number, well, four different geomorphic zones have been highlighted, and these each have a variable archaeological and paleo-environmental preservation capacity. So the terrace obviously acting as a likely area for archaeological activity, but the paleo channels perhaps being more likely to contain paleo-environmental remains, but no specific archaeological activity. Um, perhaps, again, perhaps we can use other techniques such as that are more specifically focused at uh, detailing geomorphological variation, such as uh, electromagnetic induction. And in this case, we're not so concerned about trying to identify specific um, features, but just these geomorphological landfalls or changes in uh, sediment composition. Um, and it's, this is a project from the Meads, which, we, uh, which was undertaken by Wessex Archaeology, where we um, identified some lower conductivity areas at the edge of the floodplain where possible river terrace deposits were located, but also were able to delineate these former channels as well as these lower lying areas where we might expect more uh, paleo-environmental material to be located. Um, so far, the methods I've presented have sort of all been kind of looking at these 2D uh, horizontal surfaces. But sometimes it's useful to reconstruct these vertical cross-sections through other geophysical methods, such as 
uh, resistance tomography and ground penetrating radar. Um, often single transects are kind of enough to, to image quite large sediment contrasts, and we can then relate that to other data sets such as boreholes or, um, or other geophysical methods and remote sensing. So they can provide a bit of a snapshot or at least a vertical section to correspond with our other data sets. Um, so I've kind of whistled through a whole range of different methods that we have available to us as archaeologists and geoarchaeologists, um, and I wanted to try and emphasize the, how we could integrate these data sets within a deposit model, and perhaps getting these more involved in an earlier stage. Um, in the life flow of most sort of commercial development-led projects, you'll obviously begin most projects with a, develop, with a desk based assessment, and that can all kind of establish some initial deposit models potentially using existing data sets. But perhaps more importantly, we can establish a rationale for deploying some, uh, some other archaeological protection methods and answer some more specific research questions. Mm -hmm. So in a hypothetical example, we might use remote sensing to try and identify these variable alluvial landforms and then focus our resources of geophysical survey in, in the different areas. So within higher, drier areas, we'll use, we could use shallow methods of geophysical survey. But within these lower-lying, wetter zones, perhaps other techniques are more appropriate. And this can really start to inform how we then uh, approach these landscapes subsequently. So we can target the, these landforms more specifically with subsequent purposes of boreholing or trenching. Um, and ultimately, this can help to reduce risk and inform the design of any development projects. <coughs> Excuse me. So just to sum up, um, what I've tried to display here is that um, archaeological inspection methods can be extremely beneficial for the construction of deposit models. And, off, and although intrusive methods will always be required to some extent, we could better target them based on the information we've gathered through remote sensing and geophysical surveys. And one of the key advantages of these data sets is that they're often more spatially extensive than most intrusive methods, at least at the outset of a project. Um, but ultimately, a combination of all of these methods is likely to be the most effective. And finally, given that there are increasing threats to these ri the rich archaeological records that may be contained within these alluvial systems, um, either through aggregate extraction, infrastructure development, but as, as well as uh, agricultural intensification and climate change, um, these non-intrusive and predictive modelling techniques are likely to become, or should become, more um, integral to mitigating these impacts and these risks. Thank you very much for listening. Um, there's some references and a link to a recent paper if anybody wants more information on some of the stuff I've discussed. Thanks a lot. Um, does anybody have any questions directly for Nicholas? Go ahead. Um. Oh, yeah. Hi, uh, Ben Wallace from Warwickshire County Council. Um, there were a couple of things. One, one I was quite interested in the um, remote sensing. Uh, techniques you're looking at using uh, multispectral imagery. Um, and I was wondering if you'd uh, trying to, to map things from very large amounts of satellite information and data that's becoming available multispectral. Um, and, and if this could be a way to identify areas, because I think we focused on using AI for archaeological sites. Mm -hmm very particular ones, but yeah. not really for paleo-environmental remains or landscapes. Yeah. Uh, and, and I'm wondering whether we, we, we should look at that, having seen what you've, you've put up there. Yeah. So that, that was the, the first yeah. one. Sure. Do you, and there was a second one, which was, um, where do you see your sort of proposals used in the planning system? Because you're talking about sort of quite specific process of looking at the, the techniques to be applied to pick up some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. How would are you think only large sites, only particular landscapes? Should development control, development management archaeologists be changing the way they do their briefs to include some of this? Are, are they doing enough? Are they not doing enough? Mm -hmm. So, sort of two sides really one on the tech side and one on the sorry for a lot of stuff. Um, thanks, that's some two really good questions. Um, I'll do them one at a time, obviously. <laughs> um, so with AI and um, uh, automated sort of interpretations, I suppose, ultimately, is what you're getting at. I've, there's been some really great <coughs> research on that, particularly using more effectively LIDAR. Um, 
And although one of the key advantages of multispectral images is this multi-temporal aspect in that we can image an area multiple times and with data sets like Sentinel-2, which revisit every couple of weeks, although being quite low resolution, they could be really effective at um, identifying these alluvial landforms. And you could do automated classifications of those data sets to pick those out quite effectively. One of the biggest challenges we have with satellite data, particularly in the UK, is cloud coverage in that large swathes of that data set will be covered in cloud. But you can, I, you can extract a, appropriate data sets, but you need to sort of think about what data sets, when you're taking them. To, for, for example, at the sort of onset of the crop periods of sort of early spring to summer, you're more likely to see some of these features well as in wetter periods when there's either cloud or it's just all very wet. And in a floodplain setting, it's largely flood. <laughs> and certainly in the Lower Lug Valley, um, I've nearly got stuck there in a flood once. But anyway, yeah, so, but there's loads of potential for AI, but I think it's, it's more challenging with multispectral data sets than it is with, with LiDAR data where you can um, essentially sort of see those topographic things. But you can almost certainly do it, but I haven't gone as far to do that, but I could do classifications. Do you need me to shut up now? Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> perhaps we'll have a chat after about your second question. Yep. But ultimately, I think um, within a development-led kind of um, sphere, they, you know, we, I, I think on larger schemes, some of these remote sensing um, approaches are more appropriate. But I just mean we can sort of think some, on, a, on a small scale, we can use, if you're going to do a gradient survey and your site's only 40 hectares or something, then, then fine. But if your site's HS2, then, <laughs> you know, there's a whole range of stuff you can do and, and has been done. So anyway, there we go, which nicely leads on to Jay talking about HS2. <laughs> <laughs>